Welcome colleagues from around the world. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you all are. Welcome to the first webinar as part of our new series, Responding to the Pandemic Together, a special FIP series on COVID-19. Very happy to have you here and looking forward to having a very interesting discussion and a Q&A with you all. We'll be starting the webinar shortly. We can see that some people are still joining. And we'll just give it a few seconds for everybody to log in. In the meantime, I'll be introducing myself. My name is uh, Lina Badr. I am the FIP lead for Workforce Transformation and Development. I work uh, within the FIP headquarters in The Hague, and I'm also part of the FIP. COVID-19 core team. This is a special team that's been commissioned um, to develop a program uh, to respond to the pandemic and work uh, with you, our colleagues and members from around the world to deliver what pharmacy needs at these times. I'm also working on coordinating the webinar strategy. So very excited to be um, hosting today's inaugural webinar. And we're gonna be having regular webinars, exciting topics, and we'll be asking you for some feedback on that. You can email me at lena at fip.org, especially if you have any ideas with regards to webinars, topics we should be featuring, etc. I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes before we um, introduce our special speaker, my colleague Gonzalo, on just telling you a little bit about um, FIP's response to COVID-19. Just a very brief timeline here that gives you an idea, and it's, this is still being updated regularly. Um, of, of course, everybody knows by now, since the outbreak of this pandemic in December, things have escalated relatively quickly, and FIP being a, a global pharmacy and health organization, we have been very alert and in constant mode of assessment of risks, of issues, of impact on our members and our colleagues around the world. So this is just a brief timeline that tells you what we've been done, what we've been doing, what, what we have done, what we have been doing in response to this. So um, almost one of the most immediate actions is we immediately began, especially after this was declared a pandemic, but also well before we have uh, developed international guidelines on, new on, on this new coronavirus for pharmacists. And this is the main topic of today. Gonzalo will be talking about the guidelines, discussing the updates and the content of that. We have also held it earlier on in February, a first webinar for controlling the outbreak. Um, and uh, we have then, obviously, as, as most FIP members know, and if you're familiar with our work, you'll know that we host a number of events and congresses and conferences um, throughout the year, including some uh, regional conferences that we have started organizing since last year. So we have had to make some assessments and decisions um, to uh, safeguard our members, our participants, of postponing um, a regional conference we were planning to hold in Africa in June. And we've also had to postpone a regional conference for Southeast Asia, which had been planned to be delivered last week, in fact, just a few days ago. Um, we have also uh, safeguarded uh, and, and implemented um, the, the safeguarding mechanisms uh, for our team within HQ. We've been following um, the Dutch guidelines and ensuring that FIP staff, for them to continue to deliver everything you need, that they would need to be safeguarded. So we've been following that and we've been working, all of us have been work, working remotely, as most of you have been probably. We've also made a difficult decision to postpone our Pharmaceutical Sciences World Congress, um, which happens every couple of years and it was supposed to take place in May in Montreal, Canada. So we've also had to postpone that. And we've communicated all of these um, with you, our members and our colleagues around the world. We've also constantly worked on updating the guidelines so we have continued doing that um, uh, almost on a daily basis since the um, the outbreak following very closely what global uh, global uh, public health policies and advice and recommendations from the world health organizations and other partners around the world so this has been a very very core component of our program of work we've also issued a position statement on the use of ibuprofen and other medicines in covid and consalo will shortly be speaking more in depth about um, our positions on the treatments and current guidelines We've also taken a decision to um, uh, hold some business meetings that were due to take 
place face to face in The Hague in April to hold them uh, virtually. Um, and just a very general response is we've had to, to coordinate all of these um, activities, but also much more to come. And you'll be hearing much more about our FIP, uh, FIP COVID-19 program of work. We've set up a FIP COVID-19 core team within the HQ, especially to deliver, develop, and run a special program of activities on COVID-19. And this is really to ensure that all constituencies of FIP, including pharmacists and the pharmacy workers all around the world, are engaged and supported during these challenging times. And uh, Gonzalo and I are part of this team and we're very, very happy to be taking you through the first webinar today, just to give you an introduction into everything we've been doing uh, before we take forward this webinar series to cover many, many other topics and aspects so what are these webinars about? And this is significant. We want you to know about the aims of these webinars because we want we will be shortly asking you to tell us if you have any special ideas or topics of rec or recommendations for us. But the, the main aim of these webinars, and they're really extensive, and I know it's a long list, but it's really important. It is obviously to provide the relevant information and guidelines on pharmacists and everything we've been doing. And this webinar really meets the aim of that. We decided to start with this on purpose just to make sure that you're all well aware of what we have to offer, where you can find it, what other resources, networking opportunities we can offer you just to get uh, just to set everybody up really with us. We also want to share and discuss strategies that have been adopted around the world by pharmacists and pharmacy leaders and workers. So we will be featuring some special sort of spotlight stories from our member organizations just to, sh to show how they've been responding to the pandemic. We also want to uh, focus a little bit on sector specific or area specific impl impl uh, implications that COVID has been having, whether this is in science or in practice and all practice areas, but also in education and um, higher education. And that's been uh, one of the hardest hit um, uh, sectors from the pandemic. So we'll make sure that some of our webinars will also be sector specific. We also really want to hear from pharmacists at the front line and pharmacy workers in general we want to hear about how they are facing um, the, the these challenges and what realities they are experiencing so we'll be uh, we'll be also organizing special informal conversations with pharmacists from around the world to hear from them. So if you are interested in that, I'll tell you in a moment what to do. Uh, we also want to discuss the implications of the pandemic on core issues such as patient safety, on supply, on medicine shortages, uh, even diagnostic shortages and um, that have been exacerbated by this pandemic across the nations and across regions and how it's impacting them differently. We want to also consider and have a chance to discuss the impact of this disease on patients across all age groups and those with already existing conditions and that's been a huge issue for us because other diseases have not stopped and that's another issue we will ensure that we focus on as well finally but not not really finally because we will continue to expand this list depending on what you tell us you want to see but we also want to assess and discuss the evidence behind treatments as well because that's a very contentious issue very very important and the process for developing therapies vaccines tests etc which will become pertinent and important as um, scientists proceed and progress with um, their discoveries and developments. So this is in a nutshell the aim of these webinars really. And I just wanted to put this out, out there to say really, really a huge warm welcome to any ideas from you on webinar topics you think we should feature. We also, uh, like I mentioned, would like to hear from pharmacists at the front line. So if you'd like to share your story or think a colleague of yours is worth hearing from or we, we should spotlight there please email me at lena at fip.org and we'll try and schedule schedule everybody in within the next few few weeks and months um, we are starting these webinars um, as a weekly uh, activity we might have more than one a week um, and we will continue to deliver them as long as needed and that's going to be a very major component of the COVID-19 FIP program among other uh, items just some house rules and some housekeeping <clears throat> just to let you know this webinar is being recorded the, re the recording will also be freely available not only to our members but also to 
everybody around the world and it will be uh, listed in the FIP information hub webpage uh, fip.org slash coronavirus what we'll do later on is do a mini tour of this um, web page because it does host everything we're doing so it's, it would be we think it might be a good idea to just show you around that web page um, you may ask questions or send your comments by typing typing them into the questions tool. You'll see that on the right hand side of the panel. And we are always, always welcome your feedback on our webinars. You can either email me, uh, lean at fip.org for COVID-19 specific topics, or if you have general feedback about the webinar, please email webinars at fip.org. All information in this video are confidential, cannot be copied, downloaded, or reproduced without formal approval of FIP. Having said this, please do get in touch if you'd like to use or disseminate this in any way, and we'll be happy to have a discussion with you. So what are the learning objectives of today? <clears throat> Very simple. Really, we want to focus on the guidelines with you today. We want to discuss and showcase the guidelines that we have in COVID-19. What's in it? Uh, what does it cover? What kind of information is there? What are the latest relevant information? What are the latest updates? Because that's an important issue. We also want to showcase the roles that pharmacists and the pharmacy workforce in general can play to, con to help control the pandemic. So you'll see that naturally emerging. Importantly, and that's going to be the focus of our discussion today, is we want to also hear from you on what further information should be added, in your opinion, to the guidance and content ideas to help us, not just with the guidance, but also future webinars and updates. So everything you send in, today through the questions tab, although we, may we may not be able to respond to live during the next hour or so, but we promise we will be following up on that. So everything you send us today will be used to uh, help us develop a plan for webinars over the next weeks and months. So thank you in advance for being proactive and sending us all of, our, all of your ideas. I'm now pleased to introduce to you my uh, dear colleague, Gonzalo. Gonzalo and I have been working together at FIP for a few years now, since my start that he's been working in FIP for some time. He's currently the FIP lead for practice development and transformation. He's obviously also a member of the FIP COVID-19 um, core team, but also the response task force, which has worked on developing the guidance. And Gonzalo can also uh, discuss that uh, explain that a bit more for you later. Um, you see his email there if you have any questions for him, but I do want to tell you a little bit more about Gonzalo. He's graduated as a pharmacist from the University of Oporto in 2000. Um, he's now leading practice development and transformation at FIP. He authored the FIP study, Pharmacy, a Global Overview, Workforce Medicines Distribution, Practice, Regulation and Remuneration. He also co-authored a number of reports, including the latest in 2019, Beating NCDs in the Community, the Contribution of Pharmacists, as well as FIP Global Vaccination Advocacy Toolkit, supporting and expanding immunization coverage through pharmacists. Needless to say, all of these reports are also available on the FIP website. He also co-authored FIP's guidance to support the response by pharmacists in the pharmacy workforce to the COVID-19 pandemic. So it is my pleasure to introduce Gonzalo, who will take you through the um, guidance and you'll hear directly from him. And I'll be back shortly. Gonzalo, hi. Hello, Lena. Hello, everyone. And thank you very much for making the time to attend this webinar. Thank you very much for the introduction, Lena. Um, and as Lena was saying, uh, FIP established a response task force um, right from January when, when the, the, the pandemic was still somehow limited to some of the Asian countries. Um, but we somehow understood that this would become sort of a global a health concern and, and, and after especially WHO declared it um, as, as such and, and, so, and therefore we, we felt that we needed to produce some guidance to, to support our colleagues around the world in responding to, the, to the, this new uh, disease, this new virus. Um, so we, we published the first guidance on the 6th of February um, and it was translated by several of our member organizations, so we had about 15 translations online. And we also produced what you see here on the background, uh, the images are to um, are a poster uh, with some guidance uh, for uh, patients and to, to support pharmacists in advising and, and doing some triage of patients and referral. Um, what we 
new at that time. I mean, it was very much attached to uh, traveling to uh, areas that had been affected by the virus. So all these resources have actually uh, very quickly become sort of outdated by uh, and because of the rapid evolution of the knowledge and the experience about this virus and and the the, the magnitude of the of the pandemic, um, and therefore, um, Lena, can you click please? Um, Exactly. We just wanted to highlight that these resources that you may have seen, that you may have printed, you may have disseminated uh, through, through in your countries or to your colleagues, uh, either in English or the various translations that we have, these should no longer be used because they, they do not correspond to FIP's current stance on, on these uh, issues uh, and the current scientific um, knowledge and, and, and evidence about the virus and the disease. So we do uh, ask you to not use these materials anymore and to instead check the, 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 the web, our dedicated webpage, fip.org slash coronavirus, for the most updated um, resources. Next, please. So um, as I said, we updated. There was a thorough update of these, uh, of these guidelines uh, in March and we published on the 19th of March and then again on the 26th of March uh, an updated version of our guidance. Um, it is now split into four parts. The first one was on clinical information and treatment guidelines, then another one which are the guidelines for pharmacists and the pharmacy workforce, and then two smaller ones, one with a list of frequently asked questions and their answers, by our patients um, and also a list of the myths that are circulating, uh, fake news and, and, and evidence, um, information and, and, and advice that is not based on any type of evidence. Uh, so those, are, those myths are also, some of those are also collated in this document and, and also some information on how to dispel them. Um, and then a final uh, part is a, a list of additional resources in a number of languages as well that you may consult, and we will be updating that as well. In addition to these four documents with the, guide and, with the guidelines, we have produced um, 10 summary guidance sheets based on the information, especially on parts A and B, of course. And these were also published on the 26th of March. And all of these resources are also being translated to multiple languages. We are uploading the, the translations as soon as they become available and we take this opportunity to thank several of our member organizations that have selflessly uh, and, and swiftly translated these, um, these resources in record time so, they, they, so that their colleagues in their countries and other countries that speak the same language could access all these guidance uh, documents in, in their own language. Next please. So uh, starting with what is a coronavirus, maybe at this stage, this question is, uh, I won't spend a lot of time on this slide because we've heard so much about this new virus, but just so we know, uh, because understanding what the virus is and how it's formed and how it operates uh, also helps us understand some of the preventive measures, some of the disinfection processes and products that we can use. So coronaviruses in general are a, a large, a family of large enveloped positive stranded RNA viruses. They have the largest genome among RNA viruses uh, which, and, and, the, and this genome is packed inside a helical capsid. Um, and from, they are enveloped viruses, so they have this uh, sort of round uh, envelope, which is a lipid uh, layer, a double, lip, a double layer. Um, and outside of, of, these, of this uh, envelope, uh, there are proteins that protrude um, and, and have the form of spikes. Um, and it's precisely the, these spikes that give it the, the shape of a crown, uh, which is where its name comes from. Uh, corona is the, the Latin word for crown. And, and these spikes are um, crucial uh, to determine how the virus actually enters um, the host cells and it also determines tissue tropism and induce an immune response in the host or in the affected individual. So a, a mutation in one of these proteins probably made it uh, allow this virus to cross from an animal host 
to a human host because it, it gained tropism to um, human uh, tissues and, and gained the capacity to infect human cells. Next, please. Um, so we, I mean, this coronavirus uh, or this virus, now we say coronavirus as if it was the only one, but we know that uh, it's a large family of viruses and several of them infect humans. You know? So it's not the first one, as we all know, that infects uh, humans. And in fact, um, several of the viruses that um, produce the common cold, uh, which generally doesn't have major consequences um, is also are also coronaviruses so from the same family um, but so these are most of these common cold viruses are not of major concern in clinical terms in terms of disease burden and for health systems but some some of these viruses have mutated over time uh, and gained the capacity to infect humans as I said and we all have heard of the SARS, which was in the early 2000s, and then MERS in the Middle East in, in to around 2012. Um, and so SARS was, uh, there's, a, there's a type of there, it should say SARS-CoV-2, which is the new one, um, which is very similar uh, or quite similar to the, the first SARS virus that appeared, 76% uh, uh, identical genomes. Um, and it's also a 96% identical to a cave bat coronavirus. Um, so we researchers um, think that this this virus uh, probably came from uh, these bats, and there might have been an intermediary intermediary uh, host uh, or reservoir before it crossed over to humans. But probably the natural host would be a, a bat. Next, please. Um, so the disease is transmitted mostly um, from person to person uh, among close contacts, and this includes uh, this is mostly through respiratory droplets that produce are produced when someone coughs or sneezes or speaks or sings. And um, so there, these are the, the activities that somehow make people um, expel these droplets which carry the virus. Um, and these droplets can land in the mouth or the nose or the eyes of people that are nearby in a distance shorter than a meter in general. Um, and so they, th this is how the infection is produced. But also these droplets can fall on surfaces or objects. And because the virus has some capacity to um, survive or to remain viable and infectious on these objects and surfaces, um, if we touch a surface that has been infected by, by the virus and then touch ourselves on the mouth or nose or eyes, we can also uh, become infected. You will see that throughout this presentation, there are images that were um, taken from the materials that our member organizations have developed. This one, for example, is from uh, the Indonesian Pharmacists Association to uh, warn patients about the modes of transmission or uh, the symptoms. So you will see several materials that have been developed around the world by our by pharmacists and by our members. Next, please. Um, there is, I mean, what I've described were the, the main modes of transmission, but people are also concerned that it could um, be transmitted in other in other ways. One important thing is that it's, it is confirmed now that the, the virus can be um, spread by patients who are asymptomatic. This is a difference uh, with regards to the previous coronavirus and to other viruses, that um, on people only, only when people were, had developed symptoms, they could um, uh, spread the virus to, to other people. But with this one, um, community transmission by asymptomatic patients has been confirmed. And another thing we know is that even after the, the symptoms have remitted, uh, patients can still remain contagious for up to two weeks. So this is something that we need to also take uh, into consideration um, when, especially uh, if, if people are thinking of um, going back to normal activities or social um, uh, contacts uh, once symptoms have disappeared. Um, with regards to pregnancy, uh, and, and many people are concerned about that, and uh, pregnant women are concerned whether they might be uh, transmitting the virus to their uh, to the fetus. 
Um, there is really not much information about that at this stage. It's a very new virus. But what, um, what we know is that intrauterine or perinatal transmission has not been identified. So it doesn't seem uh, plausible that uh, or likely that um, transmission from mothers to the fetus is possible or probable. Um, in terms of uh, breastfeeding, um, there are also limited studies. Well, some there, there are some studies with other viruses, that, um, previous coronaviruses, for example. But um, it doesn't seem that the virus is has been detected in breast milk, and the WHO at the moment uh, still recommends that mothers can uh, infected mothers with COVID-19 can still breastfeed. In terms of the incubation uh, and the disease onset and the, the, the symptoms, um, the median disease incubation period is 5.1 days. And we know that uh, almost, uh, almost everyone, that's 97.5% of people um, who develop the symptoms uh, do so within 11.5 days of exposure. So you have all heard about this 14-day period for the quarantine. This is where it comes from, and this is um, it, it points to the reasonability of of this 14-day uh, period um, for establishing the quarantine for for these um, for COVID-19. We know that it's a highly infectious um, virus, and that's why in just over three months. Um, we have more than a million or uh, cases around the world, and it's present in in so many countries. Uh, the R not uh, indicator for virus for this virus is about three. That's the capacity of, of the virus, or the number of people that each infected individual can transmit the disease to, is around three for this virus. And that, even though that is a dynamic indicator that depends on a, seri a series of factors. Um, and it's uh, roughly around three. Um, so, as I said, uh, asymptomatic transmission is has been confirmed, so people can transmit it even if they don't uh, develop any symptoms at all. And we know that many people uh, actually have are infected or become infected and have the disease, but develop no symptoms at all. So they don't even realize that they have been infected, but they can still transmit the virus. Next, please. And in the most severe cases, uh, patients can develop pneumonia and severe acute respiratory syndrome, kidney failure, and that's uh, possibly these are the factors that lead to, to patient death. In terms of the most common or the main symptoms, really, um, fever is present in over 80% of patients, also cough, usually a dry cough. Um, and shortness of breath in just over 30% of patients. Um, and then you have um, muscle ache that can be present in around 11% of patients as well as one of the common uh, symptoms. And generally, there is no sneezing, which, uh, I mean, we talk a lot about how the sneezing can be uh, dangerous or a risk uh, behavior for uh, the transmission of the virus, but in, in fact, uh, the sneezing is not uh, one of the symptoms of, of the COVID-19. Next, please. Um, in terms of the evolution and the mortality of, of this virus and the disease, we know that as of yesterday, as I said, 1.4 million uh, uh, people have been infected, and these are confirmed cases, so the figure, the real figure is uh, certainly much higher than, than these. And it had affected by yesterday 209 countries and territories. So that's practically all. There's like maybe a dozen countries in the world that have not been affected, mostly uh, remote uh, islands that have been protected by their isolation uh, from, from um, imported cases. Um, we know also that, have you, as you have seen, several countries around the world have um, implemented um, social distancing measures and confinement. And, and what we know is that in some countries that have been mostly affected by, by or mostly hit by COVID-19, like China, Italy, uh, Spain, the US, um, and, and a few others, 
um, the figures are or the, the progression of the disease is now beginning to slow down slightly, which suggests that those preventive measures are having a positive effect. So I think we all need to uh, also encourage people to stay home as much as possible. Um, um, and we know as well that many of the people who have, or the last, the vast majority of people who have died were either um, of um, older ad adults, uh, so um, above 70 years of age, uh, or had other underlying conditions such as diabetes or cardiovascular diseases. So overall, um, the virus has had a, a mortality rate of 3 to 4 percent. It's very hard to estimate a mortality rate in the middle of a pandemic, so I think that uh, we will only know the, the actual figure uh, once things uh, settle down and 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 the and the pandemic is under control, and 83% of the cases are mild or asymptomatic. In terms of treatment, um, and as Lena was saying, there is um, there are there are some contentious issues in in the treatment. What we know for sure is that we do not have a specific. Uh, treatment to for for COVID-19 for this virus. So uh, the treatment is mostly symptomatic uh, and supportive, um, depending on the patient's clinical condition. It includes oxygen therapy, hydration, and fever or pain management. And whenever a bacterial co-infection is present, then antibiotics can uh, be used as well. Uh, it is relevant uh, as pharmacists um, to know the types of medicines that need to be uh, in stock. Uh, and so the, the <clears throat> you can consult also this um, in addition to our guidance that has a summary of the treatment options. Uh, we do recommend that this um, website of our member organization, the American Society of Health System Pharmacists, ASHP, uh, who has conducted and is regularly updating an assessment of evidence uh, of the various treatment options, either uh, treatments that are um, commercially available and in the market in many countries, but also some that are still in the phase of clinical research. Uh, some of the antiviral medicines that have been used uh, in, in various countries around the world um, include uh, alpha interferon, uh, lopinavir, uh, ritonavir, which is a fixed combination of uh, antiretrovirals that are commonly used to treat HIV patients, ribavirin, and umifenovir. And in some patients, symptoms have also improved significantly with remdesivir, which is a new uh, antiviral that is that had been sort of developed for uh, other coronaviruses. Um, but it's not yet uh, available in the market in, in most countries. Next, please. <clears throat> You've also, uh, you may have heard about chloroquine phosphate and hydroxychloroquine. Um, these two um, medicines are mostly used for um, uh, as anti-malarials, uh, but also in some autoimmune diseases uh, such as lupus, um, but they have in effectively uh, inhibited uh, the new uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, um, in vitro um, and with successful results, with some promising results, and hydroxychloroquine has lower toxicity than chloroquine uh, phosphate. But however, this, uh, the, the, the evidence base around this is also contentious, it's uh, not very strong, uh, and so there's a lot of research and, and WHO is conducting research on this as well and several groups around the world, and there are some clinical trials um, for, for hydroxychloroquine, also in combination with uh, azithromycin, um, that has also shown some prov uh, promising results. And FIP will also be looking at the uh, evidence for, for this treatment and the, and the combination, and we will be issuing further guidance on this topic um, as, it, as we come to a, a conclusion. There is also, and, and this is an area that where FIP has uh, issued a position statement, there is no conclusive evidence uh, to establish a direct association between the use of ibupro ibuprofen and other non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and uh, an increased risk of infection or disease severity. Um, this uh, 
controversy or this uh, hypothesis has was um, uh, described in an editorial, uh, so a letter, um, an opinion article published by The Lancet that associated not only ibuprofen but also um, uh, ACE inhibitors and other medicines that I will be talking about in the next slide with an increased risk of uh, disease. But, but in fact, although this, this hypothesis is, um, of course, worthy of exploring further, um, there is not yet clinical uh, experience or evidence that uh, could lead to a complete, um, um, a, a, a full recommendation against the use of ibuprofen. And this is aligned with the position of WHO and several other organizations and FIP as well. Um, corticosteroids are not routinely used and recommended for viral pneumonias or acute respiratory distress syndrome and should be avoided except in circumstances where um, clinical judgment should uh, consider that uh, they are necessary to control um, inflammation. Next, please. Um, as I said, there's also no conclusive evidence that um, ACE inhibitors, uh, the inhibitors of the angiotensin converting enzyme um, or the angiotensin receptor blockers could predispose uh, individuals to adverse outcomes should they become infected with COVID-19. So there's millions of patients taking these medicines and therefore um, this was uh, quite a, a sensitive uh, issue and recommendation because it could um, lead many of the patients to be in doubt or questioning whether they should uh, interrupt or discontinue their treatment for, for hypertension and for other conditions. Um, so FIP considers that patients should continue taking these medicines unless specifically advised to stop them by their uh, doctor, by their medical team. Um, and, and a new type of treatment that has been uh, uh, tried in China, that also other um, groups are testing it in other countries, and there's even some initial industrial development in, in this sense, is to use the plasma of convalescent patients, um, which is rich in, in, in antibodies against the virus, to treat uh, clinical, uh, critical, um, critical, critically ill uh, patients. I'm sorry. Um, we know that vaccines against pneumonia, such as pneumococcal vaccine or Haemophilus influenza type B vaccine, do not provide protection against this virus. It's a completely different virus, so these vaccines do not work. And you will see that in our guidance, uh, we also include some uh, suggestions that were recommended by the Chinese Pharmaceutical Association, medicines that are used in the medicine uh, in Chinese traditional medicine. Um, and so they might not be commonly used in other parts of the world, but they are relevant options in, in China and other um, regions that may use um, um, traditional Chinese medicine. Next, please. So in terms of now um, moving on to some practical um, guidelines for pharmacies and pharmacists and pharmacy workforce, we start with a slide on contingency plans for community pharmacy. Uh, and it's important that pharmacy managers develop uh, on firstly uh, an emergency plan and emergency workflows. Um, these are exceptional times, so we need to uh, avoid improvisation. So we need to know what to do uh, uh, and, and be able to respond to a situation that is entirely exceptional. Um, we need to carry out full staff training, including pharmacists and all the pharmacy workforce and all the people and personnel that work at our pharmacies, uh, taking into account the different roles that they have and the different background training, but everyone should be um, trained and educated about this virus and this disease. Um, we should also, as managers, uh, assess the health status of our colleagues, of pharmacists and pharmacy workforce working at the pharmacy. We need to protect them by uh, providing them with the, with the adequate um, personal protective equipment, um, strengthen uh, pharmacists' infection monitoring ability, uh, ensure adequate cleaning and disinfection uh, of the pharmacy premises and all the objects, and we will discuss that later. Um, also strengthen patient management, uh, patient education, infection exposure management, 
and finally waste management and you can consult our guidance for further details but i will be ex um, expanding on some of these points during my presentation next please um some questions that we have received and some very relevant uh, points that we also address in the guidance is for example what if the managing pharmacist becomes ill or cannot be present um, we recommend that a second pharmacist takes on the managing, managing, managing role and the supervision of the pharmacy staff. Uh, but it also, if this is not possible, if, if either because there's only one pharmacist or because all the pharmacists are ill, then maybe an external pharmacist may need to um, take over. Um, but what if there is a confirmed case among staff members? Well. This, to start with, this person should be isolated, uh, of course, and treated, uh, but we should also follow up all the contacts, uh, including close contacts within the, st the staff, and they, they should also be quarantined, um, regardless of whether they have symptoms or not. Um, one solution or one uh, um, proposal or one um, guidance that we uh, offer in our guidelines is that to, to divide the, the pharmacy staff into at least two shifts um, that are completely independent uh, from each other and do, do never cross, do never meet. So for example, one shift could work in the morning and then another one in the afternoon. And in between, there's, um, the pharmacy may close and they completely cleaned and disinfected uh, so that the new shift can come in. And this, is, uh, this would allow the pharmacy to continue providing service to the community in case in one of the shifts there is a confirmed case and the whole shift needs to be um, uh, needs to go in quarantine. Um, in some countries they are also using volunteers or additional hired staff um, and to, 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 to supplement the, the staff of the pharmacy. Uh, and for example if one of the shifts uh, becomes uh, ill then it may be necessary to reduce the opening hours of the pharmacy uh, and these opening hours should be um, displayed at a visible place at least outside the pharmacy and of course uh, if everyone on the pharmacy uh, either becomes ill or one of the colleagues becomes ill and has been in close contact with everyone else then the pharmacy may need to be temporarily closed and this has happened in several countries next please um, in terms of patient um, customer or patient or customer service, um, for example, if 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 a pharmacy is the only one in a smaller town, uh, then the contact with the patients should even be more minimized, and the pharmacy may need to uh, attend to patients uh, through a little window on the door or the facade, so that patients do not come in. Uh, for example, because if that pharmacy closes, then the whole community would be without um, the provision of, of pharmacy services and medicines. Um, an option that has been considered in several countries whenever possible is to use transparent plexiglass shields that you place on the counter. So there's a physical barrier uh, that stops um, or prevents uh, the infection. Um, another easier solution that is being widely used around the world, and you can see an example at this pharmacy from Turkey, uh, is to place um, marks on the ground to indicate uh, the distance that um, patients or people should not come any closer to the counter. Uh, and when none of these measures is possible at all, then uh, patients should not actually enter the pharmacy and the pharmacist or the, the pharmacy technician, for example, should go to uh, the door and ensuring, ensuring at all times that the physical distance is kept. Um, in all, in all cases, uh, you should avoid having too many people at the pharmacy, maybe limited to uh, a few patients that can be um, attended at one time. Next, please. Um, in terms of the wholesale distribution and the supply of medicines to the pharmacy by couriers, uh, they should not enter the pharmacy. And um, so um, someone from the pharmacy staff should pick up the cases uh, from outside and, and they should be disinfected before taking, taken, being taken inside the pharmacy as well. 
Um, and one service that has been um, extended, I mean, many countries had this service already implemented, but um, we, it's been, been very relevant during uh, these uh, confinement uh, times, uh, is the home delivery of medicines. So um, in, we have used an image of, of uh, the it in Italy, our member organization, Feder Pharma, has uh, established a partnership with the Italian Red Cross for the distribution of medicines to the homes of elderly patients or patients with underlying conditions so that they do not have to go to the pharmacy and be exposed to the risk of infection. We know that in some countries, um, this service is not um, uh, allowed by law, <clears throat> but it might be considered as an exceptional uh, authorization to pharmacies during these exceptional times as well. So it's worth considering even in those countries. Next, please. <clears throat> in terms of some of the processes and procedures uh, that uh, take place at the pharmacy, simple recommendations. For example, if the pharmacy has products on self-selection by the customers, this should be restricted so that people do not touch uh, these objects uh, and so the, someone from the pharmacy staff would uh, make them available to them upon request. Um, also, keep only essential objects at the council, at the counter. Um, allocate only one employee per a position at the counter and avoid swaps so, so that there is minimal uh, use of different objects by the same person and, and to, to, to contain uh, possible uh, contamination. Um, wipe and disinfect the counter after each patient or customer and have, uh, have an alcohol-based solution at hand to disinfect the hands after attending to each patient and customers. This is a, a poster with recommendations uh, from our colleagues in Costa Rica. Next, please. Um, wherever possible, encourage patients to order medicines through the pharmacy's webpage or have them delivered uh, to their home or their workplace, or they can order also by, by telephone. Uh, in some countries, this again might not be possible to order uh, the medicines via the pharmacy's webpage, but usually by telephone, at least to prepare the order and then to minimize the time that the patient uh, spends at the pharmacy. And important, very important to keep the distance of at least one meter, preferably more, when attending to a patient. <clears throat> and in many countries, pharmacists offer a range of point of care tests, um, from measurement of blood pressure to pregnancy tests, uh, you name it, biochemical tests as well. Um, these services might, or the administration of vaccines or other injectable medicines, these medicines, uh, these services may need to be interrupted for some time uh, or additional measures uh, should be taken to protect um, the pharmacy staff. <clears throat> Next please. Um, and now we come to a, a point that has also generated a lot of uh, discussion uh, among the public and among our colleagues as well, which is the use of masks and personal protective equipment. We'll start with recommendations for the pharmacy staff, and then we'll move on to recommendations for the public in general. Um, pharmacy staff can be considered to be at medium exposure risk. Um, this is because they have a frequent and close contact with people who may or may not be infected, um, and may not know that they are infected, um, but of course they are not at the same level of risk as our colleagues in other health professions that are working at hospitals or ICUs, so uh, we are at sort of a medium exposure risk. Um, and because of that, FIP considers that all pharmacy staff should wear a, a medical mask uh, to protect themselves from infection and to avoid disease transmission in case someone within the pharmacy staff becomes infected themselves. So we have a, a, <clears throat> a duty as health professionals not to become um, um, to infect others ourselves. Um, pharmacy staff, depending on the situation of their country or their own health condition uh, or the roles that they play within the pharmacy, they may be, need to uh, wear additional uh, personal protective equipment such as gloves, uh, a gown, 
face mask or goggles, for example, or a face shield, depending on the tasks they perform. We just mentioned, for example, vaccination or other services that may require a closer contact with the patient. So if, if those services are not discontinued temporarily, then this type of measures should definitely be considered. And a very important message is that the use of a mask alone is not sufficient to uh, provide an adequate level of protection. So hand and face hygiene should be performed frequently and most especially hands. Uh, and here we illustrate this with a collage um, done by a colleague from Thailand and posted on our Facebook group with images from pharmacies around the world of pharmacists wearing different types of personal protective equipment goggles, different types of masks, uh, caps, uh, full uh, suits, so it uh, depends really on, <clears throat> on, on the situation. Next please. Um, again, I said the, the, the most important distance, even more than masks themselves, is to keep a distance of at least one meter uh, from patients and from members of the public uh, to prevent uh, disease transmission. Um, and respirators. Um, a, a respirator is a type of mask. You see it on the image on the right side. Is a specific type of mask that in America the the standard is called N95, and in the European Union it's FFP2. Maybe there is <clears throat> other types of names around the world. Um, these respirators are only uh, applicable to health professionals that are involved in aerosol generating procedures. And these procedures are like tracheotomies or intubations uh, or other procedures that are more invasive. And I mean, hardly ever I could think of any situation where such procedures can take place at a pharmacy. So it's uh, not recommended that this, or not necessary that this type of masks are used in the community or in community pharmacies, either by pharmacists or by the public in general. Of course, many people are using them, but this is more out of a desire to be uh, as protected as possible. But, but in fact, in fact, the, the face masks, the, the, the medical masks uh, on the left of the picture are uh, appropriate for the community setting. Next, please. And because of the interference that long beards or hair, long hair or uh, jewelry um, or uh, watches, for example, um, can can interfere with the use of masks or gloves. We do recommend that they are avoided or somehow taken into consideration that they might uh, interfere with uh, with the uh, with the protective um, capacity of this equipment. Next, please. Sorry. Um, in terms of recommendations for the public, again, uh, it's never too much to highlight that the most important preventive measures are physical distancing and respiratory and hand hygiene. So respiratory etiquette, uh, uh, which is, includes sneezing or coughing onto um, the, the bent uh, elbow, um, refraining from touching the mouth or nose and eyes, those are the measures that are most effective. Hand washing, very frequent hand washing, and with and using the proper hand washing uh, technique. Um, these are the measures that are most effective for preventing uh, the dis dissemination of the disease. And the use of masks alone is, nev is never sufficient. Um, so there is evidence that the use of masks by infected persons can prevent disease transmission because they stop the droplets from going out the mouth or <clears throat> the nose of the infected person. So this is demonstrated that it works. Then we have limited evidence that wearing a medical mask by healthy individuals in the household or in the community um, or in mass gatherings, for example, when they take a bus and it's crowded or something like that, that there is some limited evidence that it may be beneficial as a preventive measure in those circumstances, a medical mask. And then, next please. 
There is currently no evidence that wearing a mask, whether a medical mask or other types, by healthy persons in the wider community setting, including universal use of, of masks, uh, can prevent them from infection with respiratory viruses, including COVID-19. So, um, yes, uh, two days ago, the WHO issued a new document, and this is taken from that document. Uh, and some people interpreted that the document was saying that the WHO now recommends uh, universal use of masks. Um, it's not strictly like that. Uh, what WHO says is precisely there is currently no evidence that a universal or generalized use of masks is um, an effective measure to prevent people from becoming, from healthy people to become uh, infected. However, uh, because there is no evidence, WHO preferred to use prudence and to recommend that governments decide based on the epidemiology in their own countries, based on the, the situation in, from one city to the next. Um, and people are uh, advised to wear masks if the, the caseload is very high, for example, or if they are uh, particularly exposed to, to the disease, to, the, to a potential disease. So this is the situation and this is what WHO uh, has stated for the time being. Next, please. Um, it's important to understand that the, the, of course, maybe ideally, uh, and to be sort of super protective and, and very sure uh, uh, everyone could use a mask, but we have to understand that the use of masks may create a false sense of security because people often, by wearing a mask, they neglect other essential measures such as the hand washing, or, or they feel that because they are wearing a mask, they can be closer to other people, or they are tempted to touch their face, especially because there is something on their face that might be itchy or something. Uh, so they might be um, touching their face or under the mask. Um, and, and these are behaviors that are actually riskier in terms of um, uh, self-contamination um, and, and infection. So. I mean, they also the, the use of masks in generally um, may lead to shortages of masks for uh, health professionals or patients that actually need them the most. So we these are also factors that need to be taken into account. Oop, we are almost uh, in, in with the ending the the, the time. Um, no worries, Gonzo. We'll we'll stay on for a little bit more. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mia. Um, in any case, uh, if you cannot stay for uh, longer, you can then watch the rest of the webinar uh, online. Okay, so I will continue and present these. Um, so it is important for the public to wear a mask when taking care of a person with a suspected um, or confirmed case, of course, um, or if they have any symptoms at all, even if they are mild, then they should wear a mask because it might be one of those cases that the person is uh, contagious, but has not developed uh, full-blown symptoms, let's say. Um, and if they, of course, belong to a higher risk group, uh, like patients older than 65 years old, or if they have one, an underlying health condition, they should wear a mask in any public places or to protect them, themselves as much as possible. Um, and also, if they are in quarantine, then and if for some reason they need to leave the house, then they should also wear a mask in those cases. <clears throat> Next, please. Um, and in the past few days, there has been a lot of debate around the use of non-medical masks and uh, self-made masks, let's say, from cotton fabric or from T-shirts. Um, and there is no uh, really, uh, the use of these non-medical masks has not been evaluated in the community, so there is no evidence uh, to make a recommendation for or against their use. But the WHO also considers that, of course, uh, if there needs to be a, a generalized recommendation for the use of masks and there aren't enough masks for everyone, then it's, it's only legitimate that people uh, develop their own solutions to try to protect themselves and others uh, as much as possible. So if, the, if people are to make masks, uh, they need to consider a number of uh, factors, um, including the number of layers of fabric, the breathability of the material that is used, um, water repellents or hydrophobic qualities. Uh, medical masks have uh, um, a hydrophobic um, layer 
that prevents the droplets that land on the mask from uh, being absorbed and actually being um, touching the inside uh, or, or the lips, for example, or the nose of the person. Also, the shape of the mask, which is related to the fit of the mask. So, um, the mask should uh, fit well to the face uh, and just like a medical mask, let's say. Next, please. Um, an important part of um, the services that pharmacies can provide, and, and this is uh, particularly true because uh, many pharmacies uh, are the first point of contact for many people with the health system, especially when the health system is uh, so under so much strain like it is <clears throat> these days around the world, um, is to offer some triage and advice to the community and to patients. We know that in, in, in the majority of countries that have gone into confinements and lockdowns, pharmacies are still open and therefore they are a natural um, point of reference for people and the public to uh, ask questions and they, they know that they will find a health professional there um, to, to, to seek advice. So it's important that pharmacists um, firstly offer reassurance to everyone and offer sound advice that is based on evidence so that people um, can protect themselves and protect others based on uh, scientific evidence and, and, and rational behavior rather than being driven by panic or fear that might lead to some irrational behaviors. And of course, um, as infection can, can occur from asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic individuals, we need to treat everyone that comes into the pharmacy as a potentially um, ill person and precautions should be taken with all customers and patients. Um, and based on the assessment of an individual's symptoms and recent history of travels or contacts with infected persons, um, pharmacists should assess the risk of intervening and advising accordingly or referring the person to uh, the healthcare system, uh, uh, other professionals. So uh, basically doing this, this triage, which is not a diagnose, it's a risk assessment. Uh, in a large number of countries, um, community-based contagion has been the main form of disease transmission. Um, a few weeks ago, um, and, and this was reflected in our first guidance, that it was a, a quite uh, focused on travel history because it was uh, the disease was still located um, uh, as ep local epidemics. Uh, and, and so it was important to understand if the person had been to one of these places. But right now, uh, community transmission is the most common method or uh, of transmission or dissemination. So the travel history may be important in some countries that are at the beginning of the, of the epidemic in their, at national level or at local level, but it may no, may, may no longer be a relevant criterion for triage for countries that have community transmission. Next, please. Um, some notes on the viability of the virus outside the body and how to um, uh, clean and disinfect uh, surfaces and objects, uh, but also parts of the body. Um, so this is recent research, uh, this table. By the way, I have not uh, indicated the references, uh, bibliograph bibliographical references throughout my presentation. They are all in our guidance. So uh, for any, uh, if you want to expand uh, on further information, you can consult the bibliography in the guidance. Um, the virus can remain viable in aerosols up to three hours. Uh, and, and then in a series of materials and surfaces like stainless, stainless steel up to three days or cardboard paper one day, plastic up to three days and copper up to four hours. But the half-life of, of the viability on these materials are much, much shorter as you can see. So even in stainless steel, although in theoretical um, experiments it can last until up to three days after five or six hours and um, the majority of the virus has disappeared and another important aspect to understand is these aerosols um, there's a lot of uh, concern about the virus lingering in the air uh, for hours um, uh, aerosols are not the big droplets that are expelled when someone sneezes or coughs they there can be or they might be a small percentage of aerosol droplets, uh, the tiniest droplets when a person sneezes, 
and, and doesn't cover their mouth adequately. Um, but in fact, aerosols are most are very tiny droplets of less than five micrometers in size. Those are the ones that are most risky because they can be uh, inhaled all the way to the lungs. Um, and these can remain uh, in suspension in the air for longer. But these aerosols are generally produced in uh, medical procedures that take place at hospitals and are uh, like a tracheotomy or an intubation and other procedures. So there is largely not need to be very concerned about the aerosols in the community, although the risk does exist. In terms of uh, hand uh, disinfection, uh, plain soap and water works wonders. Um, alcohol, alcohol containing uh, gel or solutions uh, chlorine containing disinfectants, but also hydrogen peroxide. And, this, uh, and for, for the skin in general, uh, iodine based disinfectants or peroxide as well, and, and the iodine based infections also for mucosa. Um, and a series of uh, products and, and procedures that um, are useful to um, disinfect, um, I mean, heat. Uh, 56 degrees for 30 minutes or ultraviolet radiation, but also some products such as ether, ethanol, peroxide, uh, hypochlor sodium hypochloride, and, and other uh, products, but not chlorexidine. Next, please. Whoop. Um, this one is an important slide. Um, testing. Uh, the WHO Director General has said that if we don't do massive testing, it's like a fireman or a fire person um, putting out a fire with blindfolded. We don't know where the cases are, so we need to know who are uh, the cases and, and what immunity people have developed in case they have already had the infection. Um, so testing is a primary um, strategy for controlling the pandemic. And testing has can be done in different methods. Um, we know that many pharmacists uh, around the world in several countries work in clinical biology laboratories as well, so this is particularly relevant for them. Uh, the testing can be done by uh, PCR, the polymerase chain reaction, uh, or reverse transcription PCR, uh, and this is an, an, a molecular diagnosis method that detects parts of the viral genome directly, so it identifies the presence of the actual virus um, in, in the body. And then we have two types of rapid tests, uh, which include um, direct uh, antigen detection tests that detect, also detect viral components present in samples like uh, swabs and nasopharyngeal uh, secretions. And the most common ones are, would, are becoming the indirect serological tests that detect the immune response. So detect antibodies in the patient's serum and they are done on a drop of blood. And these are the rapid tests uh, take around 15 to 30 minutes, whilst the first, the PCR tests take um, four, four hours, more or less. Um, at this stage, the, the serological tests um, cannot compete in accuracy with the PCR uh, techniques, uh, especially in early phases of the infection. Um, they, they can produce some um, false negative results. So a positive result is definitely an infection um, or someone who has had an infection, but a negative result could be someone who has not developed a, an immune response yet or is not in conditions to develop uh, a detectable level of antibodies. And this could be the case of older patients or immune, immune suppressed patients, for example. So the, the use of serological tests needs to be um, done under protocols and especially it's especially useful for symptomatic patients. Next, please. I think in, in this, on this graph, you will uh, understand this very clearly. Um, so the point zero on the graph is um, the moment of infection. And the line, the blue line, is the presence of the actual virus, so the antigen. And this can go from day zero to day 24. And the onset of symptoms is here on day seven, and uh, on day five, 5.1, what, what we said approximately. Uh, so initially, we see that there are about seven days uh, where there are no antibodies. So if you run a rapid test 
here in, on this phase, it will give a negative result when in fact there is an infection. On approximately after a week uh, upon exposure, uh, the body, the immune system produces uh, IgMs, the immunoglobulin M, um, which is an immediate response. Uh, and so there is a quick peak of IgMs. And then later, about on the 14th day, um, the production of another type of antibody, IgGs, uh, in, is, is started. And these are the ones that offer a longer term immunity to the patient. So these are the ones that remain even after the virus has gone. Uh, so you can see that depending on the moment where you run a, one of these rapid tests, it will deliver different results. So it is important to, they will be very useful uh, in the after pandemic or as we go out of the confinement uh, period to identify those patients that have been in contact with the disease or the virus and, and have developed some level of immunity and can therefore return to work or to their normal life uh, and do not worry anymore about it. And those that have not had any contact with the disease and might need to be particularly followed up for symptoms. Next, please. Um, and here, I'm really not going to spend any uh, a lot of time. As I said, there is a, a, a part of our guidance, part number three, that addresses frequently asked questions and, and frequent myths. I've included a number of questions here that are just a few examples uh, that you can find the, the answer to these, to these questions in the guidance documents. And the next one. And the myths, uh, the same thing, like there's a lot of misinformation being spread in WhatsApp groups, on the internet, a lot of conspiracy, conspiracy theater theories um, and yeah, generally fake news that we need to be aware of their existence and to verify uh, their veracity and to inform the public and our patients based on scientific evidence and, and valid information from reliable sources. So this is a big no. Next, yeah, this is, I'm done from my side. Uh, if we, I see that we still have around a thousand people on the line, so thank you for bearing with, uh, with our delay. And back to Lena, thank you very much. Thank you so much for that, Gonzalo. Very comprehensive overview. And we have over a thousand of you with us online. As you can imagine, we're having hundreds of questions. So I've tried my best to steer the slides, but also very rapidly have a look at some of the questions and just some general comments. First, I'd like, like to just maybe offer this disclaimer just to clarify, because this recording will be made available afterwards and um, uh, people who, are, who may be listening to me now may be watching this in a few days and by then maybe some guidelines or new uh, evidence will have emerged. So we just want to say that we try our best to keep these guidelines up to date, but we recommend you consulting the World Health Organizations and the policies of your national governments as well um, of any new evidence. So just wanted to say that disclaimer Gonzo on our behalf and just some general responses to some general questions that we're receiving. Um, Gonzo's mentioned this, references are all in the guidance so we are receiving some questions about where the evidence is, um, uh, what's the back backup evidence for this or that so we just say please do refer to the guidance and if there's any further questions please don't hesitate to email us. The other thing I, uh, I wanted to say is we thank you for all of the great ideas for webinars so I see a lot of people um, sending through lots of uh, lots and lots of ideas for webinars. Please keep those coming. We'll keep a record of all the comments and questions. Unfortunately, we won't be able to answer each one now, but we promise that none of them will be wasted. So please keep th those going. We are receiving as well, Gonzo, lots of questions in general about um, treatment, diagnostic, uh, alongside um, all topics covered in the guidance. Some of them have been answered by Gonzo already, so they are included in the guidance. With others, we will also uh, review these questions and consider um, covering um, the answers for them in the guidance if they aren't already, and shortly we'll be taking some specific um, examples of these. But any questions about treatment or guidance, we will uh, strive to look into whether we can include them if they aren't already. Most of them have probably been answered by the time um, the um, slides have 
ended, but we will also um, do that. We'll continue to do that. Um, we are receiving some questions as well. I just wanted to say that comment, uh, maybe that are more local context, for example, questions on whether uh, people should continue going to work, etc. I can imagine most of us are in lockdown. Of course, lockdown strategies differ across nations, so we can't offer guidance on that. Please do refer to your um, ministerial and uh, global um, strategies and, and recommendations on that. But we do have a, a couple of questions. But before that, I'll just take a break and firstly, really quickly say, we will strive to finish by half past. So thank you so much for staying on. And as we mentioned, a copy of this recording will be made freely available and we will also circulate it. So lots of questions are coming in on whether the recording can be shared with your colleagues. Yes, you will be receiving um, a link to the recording. Please feel free to forward it to all of your colleagues. As we mentioned, they will be freely available to everybody around the world, not just our members. And we've made that special uh, decision for the COVID um, series. Um, the focus, the focus question today, which uh, I'd like to invite uh, a lot of you to think about, is having having heard most of the components uh, of the guidance. And of of course, it's not every single thing, but it's the majority. What other aspects or components do you think should be included in the FIP guidance? This is the focus question for today. So, if there's anything that hasn't been answered, or you think should be maybe expanded on or clarified, this is the time to please go to the question tab and insert um, your comments in there. What I will be doing just for now is very quickly taking you on a tour. So I just wanted to um, mention two important links um, where you can find your uh, lots of information and resources from. One is we've um, established a special web page uh, called the FIP COVID-19 Information Hub on the FIP website. This is a comprehensive web page containing all of our resources and outputs and I'll shortly show it to you. We also have established a new Facebook group called COVID-19 and pharmacy. You can just search for that on the tab, but I've also attached the links on there. Please, please uh, feel free to join that if you haven't already. It's a great platform for discussion with pharmacy colleagues around the world. It boasts, I think, more than 8,000 members, and this is just under one week, if not a couple of days. So there's a lot of interest, and this is a great platform for you to continue the discussion, to pass on some of these questions, to understand what other countries and other pharmacists around the world um, are facing or how they're dealing with things. So I just thought for fun, um, I'll just quickly show you where you can find um, the uh, FIP COVID Information Hub. If you do go to the FIP.org website, we have actually put it here really nicely and easily for you at the beginning under the spotlight. It's the one-stop shop for everything COVID. You'll see the timeline that I've um, presented earlier um, and uh, we will continue to update that. We will also, uh, you will also find copies of or, uh, all of our guidelines and um, in all the current translations, you'll see that. And any member organizations listening to us, thank you so much again for contributing. If you do have uh, if you are aware or you, if you are uh, aware of any guidelines produced in your countries on COVID, please encourage your pharmacy leadership body or please let us know about them because we are building also a repository of these guidelines online. So, so you'll find the guidance that Gonzo has um, just um, explained here and you'll see that they are divided into components just for easy, um, easy reference. And these are the summaries as well. So I'm just literally scrolling through just to get you familiarized with this. It is like a tour. And then you'll also see other FIP resources. So we do have our position statement, which we mentioned earlier on treatments. You'll find what other groups are doing, the Young Pharmacist Group, the YPG. You'll see all of our links to the webinars will be here. So the link to the earlier February webinar is already here and we'll be uploading this one here as well. All of the resources, um, great resources and great work. Uh, from FIP members and member organizations, country level action and uh, guidelines, they're also being uh, showcased in our website. So again, a call for contribution. If you are aware of anything you would like to showcase what your country is doing, please share this with us. This helps everybody around the world. Uh, thank you in advance. So that's a long, long list and we're keeping that. We also have a special section on, uh, on education and training, and we'll keep updating this on a daily uh, basis. And we also have the COVID-19 Pharmacy Facebook group. 
really, really recommend you to join that. I'll just go back perhaps to the question time and take a couple uh, to discuss. Gonzo, while you were talking, I did receive a question that maybe would be interesting for us to discuss is whether there is an, there is any current guidance on if there was an infection uh, or an infected in, uh, personnel or pharmacy worker in a pharmacy, uh, what then should be done about the pharmacy? Should that be closed? Do we have any guidance on that? Should we consider looking to this? Any thoughts from you as one of the experts who's also developed this guidance? Thank you, Lina. Um, yes, I, I did mention that point in the presentation and our guidance also provides some um, uh, guidelines on that, but, but that's also a question that we have received after um, um, publishing the, the, the guidance and we will be updating it in more detail in the next update of our, of our guidance. But as I said, once a, a staff member has been identified as a confirmed case of COVID-19, um, then they need, of course, to be isolated and treated, but also all the colleagues in the pharmacy staff that have been in direct contact with this person need to be considered as potentially infected and therefore they need to be quarantined. Um, and this may imply in some cases that the pharmacy is temporarily closed, uh, <clears throat> which is, of course, um, a quite a, a heavy decision uh, for the pharmacy itself, but also for the community that we serve. Um, but that's why we recommend, whenever possible, to separate the shifts and that the people from the two shifts never meet and never cross, so that to to prevent uh, and contain um, the, content, the the dissemination of, of the infection for, across the two groups, so that at least one of the groups can continue uh, keeping the pharmacy open. I'm not sure if this um, answers the question, but uh, we will definitely providing, be providing more detailed guidance in the next update. Thank you for that, Gonzo. And, and needless to say, I think it's also important to make sure that um, whatever decisions are made are in alignment with local recommendations by the Ministry of Health. But absolutely. Thank you for that, Gonzo. Another question or comment, actually, about inclusion in the guidance. And Gonzo, you can um, offer some uh, advice on whether this is planned to be included, which is on taking supplements to in term, with sort of to protect against COVID or, um, yeah, as a protective measure, really. Do we have uh, plans to include that? or what are your thoughts on this? Um, that, that point is also, is also covered. Um, it, I can't remember right now if it's under the frequent uh, frequently asked questions or under the myths because some of these supplements might not really be have a, a base, an evidence base to support their use. Um, people are looking a lot for things or complements, supplements to uh, boost their immune response. Uh, what we can and, and recommend is that an immune system is mostly, of course, it needs um, vitamins and, and other elements that can sort of boost immune response, but it's mostly um, kept at best stage, uh, best state by eating a, a balanced and healthy diet with a lot of fresh vegetables and fruits, by getting um, the, the appropriate amount of sleep and rest, uh, by controlling the level of stress, for example, and by doing um, exercise and maintaining a good level of physical activity as well. So these are the types of activities that we do have evidence that work to uh, maintain a, a sufficient and, and, and good immune response. Excellent. Thank you for that, Gonzo. Another question coming in about uh, the issue of reusing masks. And of course, um, a lot of other comments about uh, you know, managing the issue of masks, especially in low resource countries, and we've covered cloth masks as an alternative, but what about the issue of reusing masks and sort of, in, in, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Um, it's a very relevant question, um, especially when there are shortages of, of, um, of masks and other equipment in so many places. And the, the, most of these um, masks are used for a single use or for a very limited use. Um, and the reason for that is that not only because they might get contaminated uh, and therefore um, they, they should not be used further, 
but you could think, okay, maybe this is contaminated, but I can disinfect it or can leave it aside in quarantine and then a few days later use it because the virus would have been killed. Well, the thing is that once many of these masks, once they are used for a certain number of hours or uh, for some time by a patient, even the the breathing them itself, the humidity coming from the patient or the person itself can alter the the porosity, uh, the characteristics of the of of the mask, and therefore might compromise uh, its filtering or its uh, capacity or the its ability to 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 protect as it had been designed to do. So, um, I mean, we from a, from a and a, a rigorous and evidence-based point of view, uh, a mask that has been designed for a single use should not be reused. Under the current circumstances, we all know that health professionals and people are having to reuse masks uh, or to, so, but at least they should be reused after having been disinfected either by heat or by vapor of peroxide, for example. Um, the, the process that sort of um, tampers the least possible with their uh, filtering capacity, let's say. Mm -hmm. And with cloth masks, for example, uh, and a, a piece of advice is that to wear a paper tissue on the inside of the mask when the mask when the when the fabric mask is used because that tissue at least can be uh, then um, disposed of and can right. also prevent the the humidity issue. Yeah, that that's great as a principle. Um, We'll take another couple of questions before we wrap up, but one is about, or, or a comment rather, about um, guidance um, specifications, which is about the potential drug interactions that may occur while taking medications that are um, mentioned as COVID-19 therapy. Is that something that's um, touched upon in the detailed guidance, or is this something that we would like to expand on? Um, we, no, we don't actually, that's a very, valid question. Uh, the guidance includes or refers to the, a number of, of options that can be used uh, or that have been used in clinical experience from around the world. We do not touch upon the issue of uh, potential interactions because that would open uh, such a wide range of, of options and, and possible interactions that we haven't really opened it. But it's, it is a relevant point that we will take to our um, um, experts uh, advisory group uh, that they can discuss and consider whether that needs to be included in our in our guidance. And just on that note, I think that uh, we will probably be organizing also a webinar specifically focused on treatment options done by an actual expert, <laughs> not myself. Uh, mm -hmm. And then and then those types of questions can also be addressed at the at that space as well. That's great, and I think that's a good reminder, Gonzo. If um, any of our attendees think that any of these topics should particularly be expanded on having a deep dive through another webinar, again, please include that as part of your webinar ideas and recommendations. We're getting a lot of questions. One interesting question from Irene. I'm not sure, Irene, where you are, but she's saying that there is some confusion in her country on the benefits of sunbathing or basically the effects of sun on prevention of COVID. And perhaps, again, that's something for consideration to the frequently asked questions and myth busting. But we may have covered something about heat. Any comments on that, Gonzo? Um, well, the only thing I've read about this is that, of course, when, when the sun is stronger now, for example, in the Northern Hemisphere, that the summer is coming, or in more tropical latitudes, for example, that the UV radiation is also stronger, that might have some effect on um, reducing the viral uh, load or the, the, yeah, the, 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 the infectious capacity of the virus, um, or, the, or the transmission likelihood, uh, let's say. But uh, we didn't really cover uh, the, that on 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 the on our guidance. No. There is a point uh, on the frequently asked questions about whether it is expected for the for the virus to simply go away in summer when summer comes. Thank you for that. We are still getting lots of questions, and as much as we want to answer them, we won't be able to. But we do promise that we will be 
closely examining this list of questions because it really does help us with developing the, the guidelines, uh, planning further content, whether it be through webinars or other, uh, other um, content delivery mechanisms. These are really, really valuable questions. I just wanted to, before wrapping up, um, Thank you, first of all, for um, attending, but also tell you about our next webinar, which will be next Wednesday, April 15th at 3 p.m. Uh, CST, exactly the same time we started this webinar. This will be about learning from China. We'll have some colleagues from Pharmacy from China to talk about um, medicines use in the Wuhan epidemic areas and learning from Shanghai and pharmaceutical care for infected patients. Obviously, a very important perspective considering China's exper experience um, and exposure to this uh, virus. We will be sending a registration link circulated to you very soon. We will also publish this webinar shortly on all, all of our social media platforms. So we thank you in advance for considering to attend this and please circulate um, these webinars to all of your colleagues. I would like to take this opportunity to say thank you to Gonzalo very much. Thank you so much, Gonzalo, for this comprehensive uh, and very, very informative um, presentation. And um, thank you in advance for all the hard work on continuing to update the guidance, working with a lot of FIP volunteers as well, experts around the world who are helping us with this documentation. And you, our webinar attendees, uh, be you at home. Thank you for staying home. If you are at the front line, thank you even more. Uh, we are all staying home for you. Uh, thank you again. And I think we can all say that together we can help um, stop this pandemic. Thank you once more, and we look forward to having you um, next time, next week. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.